If it hadn't been forgotten, I'd go. I'd been married a long time ago. Where did you come from? Where did you go? Where did you come from? Cotton Eye Joe. So we're going to continue with the origin series, and we have another stop that we're going to make in the Old Testament, and, and it's a, a guy you might have heard of by the name of Moses. Now, I've already skipped over a lot of um, key individuals in the Old Testament, names like Joseph, Isaac, Jacob, those, those names, we're, we're jumping over them, and not because their life isn't worth looking at, it's because a series has to end sometime, and, or not end, but we've got to make it through this series, and uh, we could go through literally every person of the Bible, but then by the time we get done, I would be retiring. So um, we're going to look at a guy by the name of Moses who is so pivotal in this, this grand story that we have. Um, scholars and the research that they've done, they, there's so many parallels between the life of Moses and the life of Jesus. And um, one of them being the fact that uh, in the New Testament, Paul wrote that the children of Israel were baptized into Moses. Um, I mean, that's really strong terminology because there, there, there's a little bit of, of, of holiness and it's kind of a tampering with deity uh, that, that was placed upon Moses. He was that big of a figure in the Old Testament. And um, there's, there's a lot that goes on with where we're going to pick up. There's a lot that has happened since we're uh, just before where we're going to pick up today. And I'm not going to give you a history lesson this morning, but I do want to set the stage. And so hopefully you like context, and hopefully you like to understand the, the, the magnitude of what's happening here. But um, there's a, so there's a lot that's happened. We talked about Abraham last week and how God established his co- covenant with Abraham. And then we go through several years where Joseph, we, some of y'all might remember his story. He has a crazy story. Would love to teach on his life someday. But he um, is shown favor throughout his life because of his commitment to God. And he becomes second in command in Egypt. And so we pick up in a place where we now have a Pharaoh who doesn't remember, he has no knowledge of Joseph. And this is where we are today. And so um, he noticed that there is a massive population of Israelites. They, all they did is, is work and be fruitful. That's it. They, they would work and build stuff, build bricks and all this kind of stuff, make bricks and have children. That's, that's pretty much summed up their life. And so they... Pharaoh's looking out at this mass amount of people, and he tries to put a stop to it. Um, and he goes about it a few different ways. He told the midwives, go out, and, and when the baby's being born, we want you to kill it if it's a boy. I mean, it, that's, we don't live in days like that. Yes, our days are kind of crazy right now, but nobody's putting a mandate to kill baby boys as they're being born. But that's what was placed in that day. And, um, and so he put that pressure on the Israelites, but they still kept multiplying. And so Pharaoh's like, hey, midwives, what's, what's going on? And they said, well, the Hebrew women, they're, they're not like us. They're vigorous in everything that they do. And so literally what they're saying is they have babies and they move on before we can get to them. And so there's all this kind of stuff going on where Pharaoh's trying to control stuff and, and, and minimize the children of Israel. And this is the time where Moses is born. It's kind of crazy. What a, what a crazy time frame to be born, especially if you're a boy. And we pick up in this part of the story um, where, if you're familiar with the story at all, Moses is born. There's some kind of special something on this this child's life. And his mom puts him in a basket. The, old, or the, the uh, King James literally calls it an ark, which is kind of cool, uh, being saved through water. I mean, there's a lot of parallels in here. Um, and then he was discovered as a, as a baby. He's discovered by Pharaoh's daughter. Now, Moses' older sister is following, and she comes up to the the Pharaoh's daughter, and she's like, hey, if you want to keep the baby, maybe we should 
find somebody to care for, and who better to care for the baby than his own mother? And so what happens is Moses gets to be um, under the care of his mom until, and we don't have a specific age, but it says when he grew older, she took him to the Pharaoh's daughter. Now I would have to imagine that in those moments, in those early years, and however old Moses was, and by the way, his name wasn't Moses during those years. It's likely that his parents called him by a different name. The Pharaoh's daughter called him Moses. But I guarantee you that his mom was talking to him about Abraham, about Isaac, about Jacob, and who they were, and that God was, the God Almighty was his God, and, and the children of Israel, they, they lived for him. I guarantee you that those kind of conversations were had. And then at the age when he grew up, he goes under the care of and comes under the household of, of Pharaoh. And he's, he is taught a completely different approach to life, a completely different worldview, an Egyptian worldview. And we don't have time to go into all of that and what that could have meant and who could have his teachers and, and instructors been. But he grew up in a different time and a different way of understanding from that point on. And I don't know what it was at this point when he goes off. He sees an Egyptian soldier mistreating one of the children of Israel and he goes off on this Egyptian soldier, kills him. Pharaoh finds out. And then Pharaoh hunts after Moses, and Moses flees. That's a lot to cram in there. Thank you for taking the time to listen to all of that. We had to set the stage before we read this, or else it doesn't make sense. And so Moses is 40-plus years old when he runs away, and he meets up with a group of ladies who are trying to get water and ends up marrying one of them. And he's a shepherd for the next 40 years of his life. Raised in the home of Pharaoh, the most powerful, um, the powerful man at that time, under that household, and then becomes a shepherd. Crazy. Polar opposites. And this is where we pick up in Exodus chapter 3. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and just by that alone, you can bank on it that within that 40-year time frame that they've had some God conversation, some awareness of, of who Yahweh is. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought... I love how simple this is. Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, your, your earthly father. I'm, I'm the God of, of your dad. I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard, the cry, I have heard them crying out because of their, their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. It's the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Kamnakarites, and the Olniites, and everybody, okay? And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. We're almost done. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. 
And this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And then they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And this is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. I I love going back through these things and and seeing how Moses really portrays us and and really um, demonstrates the human portion of him. And though, though he is looked at as this amazing figure in the Old Testament, which he is, He's still a man. And there's things that, that are in, interwoven into us and how we respond to God that we're going to look at. And there's three stops that we're going to make. And it's all the questions or it's all the statements of Moses. Now, it's a pretty peculiar sight. I've never seen a, anything on fire that did not burn up. But he, he sees a bush this obscure bush on the top of this mountain that is burning, but it's not burning. It's on fire, but it's not burning up. And I, I love how simple the Old Testament is sometimes. Moses thought, this is a strange sight. I shall go look at this strange sight. I have never seen this before. And so it's really interesting, though, that, that it gives even the detail that God saw that Moses went to the bush. Moses could have been like, that's weird, and walked away. Like, that, I, it must be hot today. Uh, like, maybe, maybe I'm exhausted or something. But he saw that the bush was burning in a way that doesn't make sense, and so he went to it. And even that showed God that there was some kind of, um, I might call it, um, curious, curiousness. I think that it's okay for us to be curious about the things of God. Maybe even clueless. But, but there's, a, there's an approach to God that, that is so innocent. I think that's why God loves children because there's no limit to children in their mind and the way that they see God. Even this morning I was sitting here talking with Aubrey about communion and I was like, okay, here's this and this, we've got the bread and the juice. And she's like, I, I know, Dad. And I was like, and see that cross up there? Jesus died on that cross. She goes, I know. I was like, he, he didn't literally die on that cross, but a cross, and had explained all of that, and, or I chose to. And, but, she's, but before he could even say it, she goes, no, he died on the cross for me. I was like, add a girl, right on. And it was like, duh, Dad, Right? Children are just, they're right there with the things of God. I don't know what it is about growing old, older. I don't know what it is about getting older where we lose the, the imaginative part of, of who God is. I'm sure some of us in here, if not a large percentage, would look at a bush that's not burning but it's on fire and be like, okay, who's, who's doing the magic tricks? And rather than saying, oh, that, that could be God. And so out of curiosity and out of this um, just pure, what, what is this? Innocence, what, what is this? This wonder, Moses approaches this bush that's burning, but it's not burning, bush. And God, we have to pay attention to punctuations. There's exclamation marks after Moses' name. And so I'm sure it wasn't like Eeyore, Moses. No, it wasn't like that. It was probably Moses, Moses. And we see his naivety in how, I I would imagine when he heard his name, he started approaching the bush. And he says, here I am. And God says, whoa, 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 stop. Where you are is holy ground. Take off your sandals. Has, it, has that place always been holy, or did God's presence make that holy? Why, why in that moment was it holy? It's, I'm sure he might have walked that mountain before. What Right now, in this time, why, why now? God's presence in that moment. It was a holy moment. 
And God said, I, I love your wonder, and I love your curiosity, and I, I, I even love the fact that you, you're a little bit clueless of who I fully am. Stop. Take off your sandals. We need to talk. See, how willing are we to be available to God that way? Where we would, we would, don't be offended by what I'm about to say. It's kind of like one of those permissions. Let me, let me insult you, but not be an insult. And I'm saying this about myself as well. There's this, um, this cluelessness of, of the full picture of who God is that Moses approaches him. I think God would, would so love it if we would approach him that way, where we, we don't fully understand. It's, it's really dangerous when we think that we know who God is and we, we act in a way that he thinks that we, we think he wants us to act. But God just wants us to be children and approach him and say, God, here I am. Tell me, I'm going to keep coming after you until you say, stop, this is holy ground. I think God would love that if we would respond that way to his presence and the things that are, is this, is this God? Stop, this, this is holy ground. But you, you call my name. I did call your name. But, but hold up. And then he tells Moses who he is. I'm, I'm the God of your father. I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And I wonder if in that moment, it was like this hyperspeed scrolling through all conversations he's ever had with anybody, his mom at an early age. This is who God is. This is who we are. We are the people of God. And, and then every phase of life and every season of life, maybe he's thinking of conversations with Jethro just going, scrolling through his mind, and, and it's like in, a, in an instant, all of this pops in his mind, and he can't help but hide himself, hide his face in the presence of God. I don't know why it works out that way, where God shouts his name and reveals himself in a flame, so clearly he wants Moses to be drawn in but if you get too close, the very nature of who God is, you, you, you aren't going to be able to, you're going to implode. I truly believe that God would love to, to be that for us today. To, his, his nature would be that for us today where there's so much intrigue and so much curiosity on, on, on our part that we would run after him and pursue him, even in our not fully understanding what we're doing. Just run after him. Be available. And it says, he, he, Moses says, here I am, God. And God doesn't dwell on who Moses is. God dwells on the hurt of his people. That's what I love about God, and that's what I love about our relationship with him. You'll probably hear me say this over and over and over again. Our life is all about our life not being about our life. And I borrow, I'm borrowing that from, from Ignite because I heard that over and over and over again. Life is all about you learning that life is not all about you. Yet you matter, but you matter when you see that others matter more than you. And so in a moment, God calls Moses and Moses says, here I am. God says, hold up. This is who I am. Here are the cries that I've heard. I'm going to use you to bring deliverance to my people. See, at this point, Moses didn't have a vision. Moses didn't have a, a picture of how he was going to be used by God. The only vision that he had for his life is, I was born in, as a Hebrew. I was raised as an Egyptian. I killed an Egyptian. I fled for my life. I've been a shepherd. So I'm a murderer, 
that has this collage of a background. That's who he saw of himself. And God doesn't look at all of that. God says, there are thousands upon thousands of people who belong to me, who are bound, who are enslaved, who are held captive, who need to be set free, and I'm going to use you to make that happen. So your life, Moses, is all about you not being all about you. That word is for us today. We may not have 600,000 plus people that we are bringing out of a land, but we have several people in Amherst, Lorraine, wherever you live, who are bound, held captive, and who are, who are enslaved to something. And we need to understand that we are there for a purpose. You are where you are for a purpose. It's not about you. Yes, I do think that we need to walk through roads of healing and restoration and things like that, but we don't get on the other side of restoration just to stand there to say, I'm restored, and then stay there. We're restored so that God can use us to reach his people or to reach people that need to know him, to be set free and and brought to him. That's what our life is. That's what we see in the story of Moses, by him simply being intrigued by the presence of God and saying, here I am. I love that. And when God shows him the picture, he goes, here I am. God goes, deliver my people. Moses goes, who am I? Who, what? I'm sorry, there, there's a lot of, of children of Israel by now. They work and produce babies. There's a lot of them, and I'm a cast out. I'm a murderer. I'm a castaway. I'm a shepherd. Who am I to do this? Chapter 4 is a lot of fun because Moses rip, or just rips off all of these insecurities how are they going to know that, I, that you're going to do this? So I can't talk that well. And it was excuse after excuse after excuse. God doesn't want us to list off our excuses. He wants us to enlist to his purpose with our inefficiencies, with our dysfunctionalities. That's exciting because that means we're all dysfunctional and we all should be signed up for the purposes of God. And he will work on us and work with us along the way. Who am I? I'm sure that Moses was hoping if we all think the way we all think, maybe you're not all like me, so maybe this is more me. I like being told who I am. Like when you see me, what do you see? I did that um, when I was on staff at Hope Chapel. I went to some of my closest friends and I said, all right, so when you hear the name Josh Smith, like me, and not, you know, there's other Josh Smiths in the world, when you, when you think of Josh Smith, what, what, do you, what do you think about? What's the first, first, uh, first thought? And uh, I, w- I didn't like what I heard. I thought it was going to be like kind, compassionate, loving, stuff like that, you know, or like, I don't know, I just I had thoughts of what I thought I would hear back. But goofy was the common word. I'll be honest with you. If I, if I was Moses and I said, who am I? And God said, goofy. I'd be like, oh, just find somebody else. What am I going to do, laugh them out of Egypt? But we all have that in us where we want to be told who we are. And what, what others think of us. And God doesn't answer his question. God says, I, I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> you didn't hear my question, God. I said, who am I? You know what I'm saying? Like, I just want to know how you think of me. I'm with you. Huh. 
So you're with me even in my dysfunctionality, and you're with me even though I, I murdered someone. You're with me even though I'm culturally confused. You're with me. Yes, that's what I'm saying. I'm with you. God is with you. Run after him in your not full picture of who he is until he says stop and run with the understanding that he's with you. He's with all of you. Everything that you represent, your bad thoughts, good thoughts, mediocre thoughts. He's, he's with you, your, the whole package of you. He's with you. And he's with you as you reach others who need to know him. He's with you when you extend kindness and you... I, I, I read this quote, or I heard this quote, Summer actually brought it to me, Bob Goff, who we're going to be doing uh, the study Love Does, he says, people don't follow vision, they, they follow availability. I love that. I've been taught all along, you got to have vision, 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 but really it's, it's being available to people. And in that moment, Moses was making himself available to God, but then he chose to lay aside all of his insecurities, and even though God didn't directly answer the who am I, he made himself available. He made himself available. Y'all, if there's anything that I'm excited about with the fall home groups, by the way, that are starting very, very soon, the study love does, and when we're doing this together, we're going to understand this being available. We're going to get creative with being available to the people that you are around. And it's one thing to sit in here and hear a preacher preach at you and go through Scripture and things like that, but you, you will more likely transform into who God wants you to be when you are closely doing that and talking that through with other people. That's why I'm excited about fall home groups that are starting up. If you haven't signed up, sign up. Sign up, okay? Connection card that we talked about, fill your name out, put your name on there, sign up for a home group. It will transform you. You can't help but be transformed because we're going to talk about the Word of God and He's going to transform your life. And He's going to do it while you're being available to Him and to others. Can you imagine? Like, like, can you imagine what this community is going to, the community doesn't even have a clue what's going to happen to it because a body of people are going to step aside from themselves and say, God, here am I. I am childlike manner following and pursuing you until you say stop and I'm making myself available. I think, I think the community is going to be like, what just happened? Where did these people come from? I didn't know I could be loved that way, selflessly. I didn't know I need what, needed what they had. I didn't even know what they had, but now I see what they have, and I want what they have. And they may not think that they needed deliverance or being brought out or they may not have even seen themselves being held captive to something until they see and experience the love of God. It's going to be fun. That was my shameless plug for home groups. Sign up. It's going to be good. So this first question, I forgot to say this, this first question, who am I? It's his first hesitation. First hesitation. We have a second hesitation. First one is, who am I? The second one is, even though he's been told who God is and all of this kind of stuff, he has a second hesitation, and he goes like this. He says, suppose I do this thing that you're signing me up for, and I go to the children of Israel, and I say, your God is going to deliver you, and he's using me to do that, and they say, What's his name? It's a hesitation on, on Moses' part. I, I, I just want to have all the answers before I do what you're calling me to do. Is that not so us? 
You're, God, I know you're calling me to be bold. I know that you're calling me to love people. I know that you're calling me to be selfless. But literally, can you give me the play-by-play so that I know what I'm doing? I don't know a single time where God does that for anybody. He says, pursue me, follow me, and you'll learn along the way. Let's do a little ride-along. But he says, who, who should I tell them, or what name, what name should I give them? Remember, he was brought up in an Egyptian home, and so their thought on deity and their thought on who God was, was drastically different than the children of Israel. What name? And God responds to this question. He says, you tell them that I am, has sent you. And I don't even know if Moses fully understood in that moment what God was saying. But God's basically saying, the, the one who has been here the whole time, I was before you even knew what was, was. Like, I, I've, I've been here. I, I am You tell them that that God has sent you. See, church, what we learn from Moses is this. He had baggage. He made himself available. And God was with him. Is that not us? Does anybody else in here have baggage? I'm not talking about weight loss. I'm talking about... I'm talking about stuff in our life. I'm talking about we have baggage that we welcome into our own life. We have baggage, family baggage, right? We have family baggage. We have people in our family who are like, whoo, if you only knew. There's baggage of statements that people have made about you. You didn't even ask them. You didn't even ask some people, who am I? But they told you who they thought you were And those comments have latched on. That's your baggage. And you know what? God would say, I'm with you. Y'all, we need to get on board with what Moses' life represents. I don't know if we have any murderers in here that's that's between, well, I would kind of want to know, but, you know. (laughs) we, We all have stuff. And we need to cluelessly and curiously and amazingly pursue God and say, God, here I am. I'm I'm available to you. What you have just told me that you want to do through me is quite overwhelming. But I'm available. Does it freak anybody out in here that if you know Jesus, that you are his ambassador? That's that's a big picture. How about this one? If you know Jesus, you've prayed the sinner's prayer. It says that you are ministers of reconciliation. No big deal, right? Just handing out salvation to people, their eternal placement. No big deal. That's that's. Grab a hold of that vision because you are ambassadors, you are ministers, that's who we are today, and we need to have the mindset of Moses where we say, yes, we have baggage, but here I am, God, I'm trusting what you say when you said, I'm with you, and I'm trusting, God, that you are, I am. To sign up for a home group, go to familyfellowship.net slash groups.